Well, welcome to the United States Spacesuit uh, Knowledge Capture Program, and I'm so glad to have Dr. Clark here with us today. He agreed to come and lecture to us um, as one of our last events of the fiscal year and essentially one of the last events of the Knowledge Capture Program. Our funding's been cut, so uh, future events will be um, as we can arrange them. So, Dr. Clark, I thank you so much for coming. Sure. Uh, today he will be covering um, spacesuits uh, as it relates to crew survival and escape and give us an overview of that. But before I let him loose on you, I would like to go over some of his credentials which are, which are quite impressive. Um, Dr. Clark uh, graduated with a Bachelor's of Science at uh, Texas A&M University and then went on to get his... Uh, <laughs> Uh, went on to get his um, medical science degree from the Uniform um, uh, Services University in Health Sciences. Um, he is a board certified uh, in neurology and um, aerospace medicine. And then he actually spent 26 years back in duty in the United States Navy. After that, he joined uh, NASA in 1997 and spent uh, several years with us here. Uh, until 2005, and while he was here, he's a six, he was a six-time flight surgeon for the space shuttle missions. He was chief of the medical uh, operations branch and was a member of the Constellation program as well. And then after he left NASA, he remained very active. Uh, he is the associate uh, professor at uh, Baylor College of Medicine, teaching in neurology and aerospace medicine. And he is a medical advisor with the NSBRI and a clinical um, professor, social assistant professor at UTMB. He's a fellow at the American Medical Association. And I have to say, we had a chance to chat, and he has told me that one of his highlights of his career was being a medical advisor on the Red Bull Stratus Project. With numerous awards, we could go on forever. I just am very honored today to have Dr. John. Hey, thanks so much. Let's give him a hand. Uh, well, well thank, thanks for having me. I, I love talking about uh, crew escape. It's kind of, it was a passion of mine actually when I was in the Navy. I was a, uh, a military freefall parachutist, a halo parachutist, probably one of the few physicians that got to do that. And then I was supporting marine high altitude reconnaissance missions. And so when I, I came to NASA, I was naturally intrigued by the escape system, the advanced crew escape system, and and then in the aftermath of the Columbia accident, I got to be a part of the spacecraft survival integrated investigation team, and my part of it was to look at the escape systems, and actually because of my interest in history, um, I dug into uh, where we'd been in the past, because I think a big part of what we need to do is to recognize uh, the shoulders of the giants we stand on. Um, and then. In 2008, I got asked to be a part of the uh, Red Bull Stratus mission, and uh, that was uh, actually just a you know a wonderful opportunity. Um, so what I'm going to talk about originally, I, t I, t I entitled it "Spacesuits uh, for Survival and Escape," but then I thought, you know, there's a lot before that that involves pressure suits, and the more I dug, the the, the more I became intrigued by how much work had been done in a time when. Uh, the understanding of the physiology, the risks, just getting to altitude was a difficult, and the materials that the uh, people building spacesuits had to work with was, was incredibly uh, limited. Um, we'll have a couple of learning objectives. I added one on the role of early pressure suit development in, in current spacesuit operations. We'll look at how spacesuits are apply in the role of survival and escape. So if you're a planetary or uh, microgravity EVA guy, you won't find this terribly interesting. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we do looking at design trades for spacesuit systems. And I've got a lot of slides here, so we're hopefully going to get rolling through here. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with spacesuits or suit pressure suits, uh, there's, there's basically three general categories. There's the partial pressure suit, the full pressure suit, and the mechanical pressure suit. And the irony of it is, is that the partial pressure suit is really a kind of a mechanical counter pressure suit. Uh, combined with a pneumatic component. Um, if you look at spacesuits, uh, we're going to talk about survival suits and escape suits, but they're also EVA suits of which we have microgravity and planetary surface types. So we'll, 
we'll spend most of the time talking about the upper two areas. And hopefully we'll get a chance to spend a little time on escape systems because that's the part of it that I really find fascinating. Um, so space uh, intervehicular uh, survival suits are primarily designed to keep a crew alive inside a vehicle uh, where you either have a, a, an inadequate pressure, inadequate habitable atmosphere, uh, or some other situation that requires that. Um, and we all know about the, uh, the, the Sokol suit that's used currently. And the escape suits are, are those, in t are they're, they're, they, they function as an IVA survival suit in addition to the ability to get out of the vehicle and do st uh, stratospheric or upper uh, atmospheric uh, bailouts or escape. Um, there are a lot of different drivers for suits and one of the things that's always a problem when you're doing suit development is what is it that you're required to do and you'll see this kind of activity morph along the way. Obviously you're protecting uh, against a depressurization event or possibly a, a toxic or inadequate uh, atmosphere. But you also have to provide some degree of thermal protection and in, in certain situations the suit is also uh, applicable in the post-landing survival situation, like the ACES suit is actually a, a, uh, a dry suit uh, and is intended to keep the crew alive uh, for a day in the water. And the ones that tested that in the testing phase uh, really hated that part of it because it's a very uncomfortable environment if you've ever done uh, cold water immersion tests. So when we look at spacesuit issues, we have a lot of different things, whether it's a custom made or off the shelf. And, how modular or adjustable it is, how you get into it. As, it, as, I've been, as I was looking through the different kinds of suits, it's amazing all the different ways that they've developed to get into a suit. Uh, whether you get into it by yourself or, or assisted, most of the early suits uh, required a fairly extensive amount of assisting. What you wear on, as headgear, and uh, whether it's a hard or soft or conformal or nonconformal is a big deal. The suit pressure is a major driver. Uh, both for the atmospheric uh, DC decompression sickness risk and also uh, the counter to higher pressure is unfortunately decreased mobility. And then all the different aspects of how the life support system interacts with the suit because obviously the suit has to have a, a viable pressure and atmosphere um, and then how it interacts with the vehicle. Um, this was a picture of Scott uh, 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 Scooter uh, Altman and, and Nancy Curry that represented the anthropometric range of the ACES suit. And both of these were, were rated military aviators. So these were not in the kind of 1 to 99th percentile. These were in the 10 to 90 percentile. So you can imagine if we're having a 1 to 99 percentile, how much excursion that is. And I think Nancy was 5'2 and Scott was 6'4. And those suit techs who worked on that probably can tell you the challenges that they face in trying to adapt to a wide range of body sizes and heights, et cetera. Um, this is a kind of a cool uh, demonstration of some of the tests that have gone on showing uh, impact loads um, and the difference between a suit uh, in the landing configuration uh, and the impact load, whether it's inflated or not inflated, and how it supports uh, uh, various structures such as the neck ring, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of factors that have to be taken into consideration, not the least of which is, you know, how does it interact with the vehicle systems? Um, there are always uh, other factors such as how, how, how much uh, space you have to stow it, how, how quickly you can get it on in the event of emergency, what's its effect on visual field, uh, the, the loss of dexterity, whether it's inflated or uninflated. The, the shuttle commanders would often complain about the, the impediment of the glove uh, uh, on, the, on the rotational hand controller inputs, even if the suit was not inflated. And they would train with us. The last day before a launch, they would do a, a suited run in the shuttle training aircraft. But I can tell you from my experience that most, I would say probably a th maybe 20 to 30 percent of the shuttle commanders would not wear their gloves uh, on, on, on reentry and landing because they didn't like the effect on the rotational hand controller. So imagine in the case of a scenario where you have a depressurization event and you don't have your gloves on. Regardless of whether the vehicle is making unusual attitudes or whatnot, the suit is essentially worthless. And so the point is that you've got to take that into consideration in the design of the uh, systems. Um, 
thermal load was always a factor. It was a, certainly a factor in the shuttle rescue missions like the STS-300 and 400, uh, where you had wave off uh, concerns and, and buildup of the ambient atmosphere temperature. Uh, if you had to get medical care while they're there, um, the fact that when you're lying on your back uh, on reentry, that you can get hot spots, and then after uh, landing, you might have to egress the vehicle unassisted. And one of the shuttle studies that Mike Greeneisen did was over 25 percent or greater, maybe even higher, couldn't get out of the shuttle and do the standard 1,000, 1,200 uh, foot walk from the shuttle, and and a fair percentage of them couldn't do it before the mission which is kind of interesting. Um, the key drivers for the per, from the perspective of the, of, the, of the wearer are, you know, pressurization, communications, uh, ventilation and cooling, and comfort, and just wearability. Um, and you can't discount the concern about hydration and waste management. I mean, even in a, in a, a suit that we were using for Red Bull, we, we hydrated about a liter an hour. Fortunately, we had a drinking port. But you also, you know, what goes in must come out. So we had to have an, a means to, uh, to remove the waste. And there's two basic mechanisms. There's either a, a catheter drainage system that penetrates the suit, or there's a, a in, in, internal uh, uh, maximum absorbency garments. But those are all things that have to be taken into consideration. Now, because pressure is such a vital part of what the suit provides, what we have to look at are what are the basic threats that are generated by that uh, lack of pressure. Um, we all know about hypoxia, inadequate oxygenation at the tissue level, uh, barotrauma, it refers to damage from uh, pressure. So barotrauma means pressure trauma. And that occurs when there's a rapid reduction in pressure uh, to the extent that gas-filled cavities like the, uh, particularly like the lungs, uh, rupture. Uh, but the, any gas filled cavity, including intestines, um, can fill up. And we had numbers of our suited runs where, uh, prior to implementing a low residue diet, low gas diet, where as the ambient pressure is reduced in the thermal vacuum or the vacuum chamber run, the person inside would get so uncomfortable from the gas expansion that they would have to terminate the test. So something as simple as uh, eating a high gas residue is important to consider. Uh, decompression sickness. Um, is probably the, one of the highest risks after the hypoxia risk, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I've got a real cool little program developed by the Air Force using uh, test data called the uh, ADRAC, the uh, Altitude Decompression Risk Assessment com uh, a Computer, and it's a little program where you put in what uh, pressure you're at, how long you're there, and how long you're pre-breathing, and it gives you a rough estimate of your DCS risk, and that driver is a, is a main consideration. Why do, you, why do you think the Russians have higher suit pressures? Because they want to reduce their uh, decompression sickness risk from uh, the, the R value or the relationship of uh, nitrogen before and after the pr pressure differential. And then finally, a, a phenomenon that I've gotten a lot of, of uh, data on lately is the ebulism. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these. So, um, the bottom line is that in the absence of an atmosphere, um, you have uh, what's in the atmosphere, what's the initial and final pressure level, and the rate between the initial and final pressure, uh, and the, the four different factors, hypoxia, barotrauma, DCS, and ebulism. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on those. And excuse me if we go through this review. Um, basically, with a rapid pressure differential, the very first thing that can happen is a, uh, is a pulmonary barotrauma. Um, and that happens literally within seconds as the lungs expand. And there's some mathematical formulas and relationships that have to do with uh, the cabin volume versus the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the cabin volume versus the uh, surface area of the uh, hole. And also that has to do with the initial and final pressures. Um, but pulmonary barotrauma is something that would happen very quickly. Hypoxia would happen, you know, seconds to minutes later. DCS maybe minutes to hours. And then as soon as you get into the realm of the pressure reduction below the water vapor pressure, uh, you, you start to get ebulism. So all these factors are, uh, are relevant depending on how fast the pressure differential changes. Um, 
In the case of uh, Soyuz 11, where the pressure depressurization was not rapid enough, they didn't have pulmonary barotrauma, but they did develop uh, all these other phenomena. Um, depending on the altitude, the rate of decompression, and whether you're bent on oxygen or pre-breathed oxygen or not, in other words, you've got some oxygen storage, your times of useful consciousness with respect to altitude go anywhere from five to 10 minutes in the 20 to 30,000 foot range um, up to you know, only a few minutes at the above 30,000 foot range to less than a minute above 35 to 40,000 foot range. So th this can rapidly impede your ability to perform crew activities. And as a result, uh, can in affect your, uh, your ability to respond to the situation. In the case of the Soyuz 11 mishap, uh, they, they, they didn't suffer barotrauma, but they became hypoxic, and they were unable to complete the, the, the turns on a valve that would have isolated the leak and, and allowed them to live, partly because of a poor design. It took like 30 turns on a stem valve to turn when it should have just taken a single motion. Um, and there are other situations like that as well. Um, decompression in uh, space is, is ubiquitous. It's pre uh, I can't think of... Uh, how many science fiction movies, this was 2001, A Space Odyssey, where people were exposed to decompression events. And usually they're very dramatic, reduction in pressure. You see the vapor uh, coming out uh, in, from the, you know, that's dissolved in the atmosphere. You see that cloud gets very cold very quick. And there's often the question of whether somebody can survive that or not. Barotrauma is one of the most significant concerns in a rapid pressure reduction. And as little as a, a PSI and a half of pressure differential in less than a, a, a tenth or a fifth of a second can cause rupture of the lungs. You can have changes in your sinus and hemorrhage there. You can have, obviously, middle ear damage. You can have gas e expansion. But the most significant one is the rupture of the pulmonary uh, system from overinflation. You have this big bag of gas, large expansion, and a very close proximity to blood vessels the gas inside your lungs in the, in, as the lung ruptures uh, goes into the vascular system. It can also surround the sac around the heart and cause the heart to essentially be frozen. Um, and these are very uh, serious and life-threatening um, problems. One of the problems with, when I talk to uh, audiences who are not totally familiar with terminology, is the difference in terms. And so you have this pulmonary barotrauma resulting in arterial gas embolism. And then, unfortunately, in the literature in the 30s and 40s, DCS was called aeroembolism. So aeroembolism, i.e. DCS, and, and uh, arterial gas embolism were often confused. And then the word ebulism is, uh, is very similar as well. So you have three terms that are variously represented in the literature that are very confusing. In fact, the spell checker on my computer would constantly replace eb ebulism with embolism uh, until I finally corrected it. Uh, when embolism occurs, uh, it can cause cavitation of the heart, so it no longer pumps liquid, it pump, it's frozen pumping air, and it can generate what's called cerebral arterial gas embolism, or CAGE, which is uh, bubbles uh, gas in the, arteri in the art arteries of the brain, which causes a very rapid uh, um, uh, stroke-like syndrome. When I was in the Navy, a large part of my career is actually spent in undersea and hyperbaric medicine, and I did a lot of research in cerebral arterial gas embolism. The relationship of uh, vessel volume to uh, leak orifice surface area uh, is also a, a, a important, and it makes sense. If you have a very large hole, um, then you have a larger uh, number in the denominator, and if you have a very small volume to very large hole, you have a number that is going to be uh, smaller in, in that more fatal range. Uh, there's a case that happened at, at the time called Manned Space Flight Center in 1966. Jim, you may have been around when that happened. I actually have a videotape of it um, that, was, uh, that I can show. Um, I'll kind of speed through some of this. Decompression sickness. Dissolved nitrogen, anybody who's a scuba diver is pretty familiar with this condition. You go from a, a higher pr pressure where you're saturated to a lower pressure, which could occur if you're under sea coming up or it, when you're at, on, the, on the earth 
going up in altitude, both of those result in an ambient pressure reduction, causes this dissolved nitrogen in your bl blood to come out of solution. Um, and DCS can be affected by the pressure differential, the time that you're going to spend uh, at the lower pressure, uh, the uh, rate of, 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 of change between the, the, the pressure from, say, the going from sea level or, or ground level up to altitude, and then other factors such as uh, age, uh, body composition. Nitrogen is stored preferentially in fat-containing tissues, so we see that in areas like the uh, uh, we see that in the areas like the brain and, and spinal cord where there's myelin. And these are some pictures of severe cases in World War II test chambers where you see actually could do x-rays and see bubbles of gas in the joint spaces. Everybody, anybody crack their joint? That's a, that's a cavitated bubble that you're hearing form. So that's probably not a good thing to do if you've got high nitrogen load. And there's a pretty large gas plane in the shoulder. Um, yeah, this is a spinal cord. Spinal cord has myelin, which is the insulator part, and the myelin is a very fat soluble, fat, uh, high fat content. So when you, we would often see uh, severe DCS that resulted in spinal cord injuries. This is much more common in diving casualties than in altitude ones, but it has been documented. Another big fat area is in the marrow, and here are bubbles in the fat containing areas in the bone marrow. Uh, now we'll get to ebulism. Ebulism is water at body temperature going from its no normal a uh, liquid state to a gaseous state. And that occurs, the vapor pressure of water at, at body temperature, 98 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius is 47 millimeters. And that's equivalent roughly to 63,000 feet or 19.2 kilometers. So when you go to that altitude, liquid spontaneously boils. And that's a picture in a vacuum chamber showing uh, uh, water going spontaneously to a gas. Um, we actually uh, have looked at every case of human exposure to vacuum. Some of these were intentional, uh, some of these were unintentional, some of these were fatal, and some of these weren't. The red ones are fatal mishaps, which we have the, the data on, uh, including uh, high altitude flight, the Soyuz 11, and the Columbia mishaps. But I'll point out that there have been a couple of exposures in vacuum chambers that have also been very useful to gain insight into. One was in 1966, right over here uh, at JSC, and the other was an industrial accident. And both those are published and are available. Actually, this is a uh, unbelievably good uh, technical report done in 1968. And I have all these electronically. If any of you care, I can give you those anyway. Um, uh, let me just show you, I'll play the video because that's kind of really cool. Jim that's LeBlanc, Jim LeBlanc was the, the test, test subject in the vacuum chamber. Cliff Hess, the supervising engineer outside. Jim, while you're exercising, I'd like you to stay intermediate all the time. Okay. I'm okay, pretty cool right now. Okay, well, you'll warm up here in a minute, so let's stay right here if you can stand it. The testing started just normally, like they all do. Uh, and Jim was at a vacuum in a spacesuit. Well, I feel pretty good cool there. With all the air sucked out, all that protected him was his pressurized suit. Then something happened. I heard over the headset that he was losing suit pressure. The tube pressurizing his suit had become disconnected. He was in serious danger. There really wasn't any feeling. It was just happening so fast, you know, trying to get the chamber back to a safe pressure and Jim to a safe pressure. It was inside the suit. As I stumbled backwards, I could feel the saliva on my tongue starting to bubble just before I went unconscious. And that's kind of the last thing I remember. Uh, essentially, he had no pressure on the outside of his body, and that's a very unusual case to get, and there's very little in the medical literature as to what happens when you have that. Um, he uh, recovered and was sent home that day. I don't know if we would do that nowadays. Um, anyway, that's in a, uh, it's in uh, Moon Machines, the spacesuit section, if you want, or if you want, I can give you the individual clip. Here's a, one of our vacuum chamber runs. 
We would do this on every vacuum chamber run to demonstrate the importance of suit integrity. And there's just a, a, a flask of water showing it spontaneously boiling. And this was one of the chamber runs that Felix Baumgartner did at Beale Air Force Base in one of the U-2 suits. Um, the most significant concern that happens with exposure to vacuum is the very delicate tissues in your lungs uh, shown here. Uh, which are two cells thick to allow very uh, adequate gas exchange to the blood vessels here, um, is very, very vulnerable to uh, damage. And the exposure to vacuum results in the very severe, um, uh, essentially, disruption of the structure, uh, the blood vessels, everything uh, goes, uh, you know, goes in a bad way. Hemorrhage, rupture of the alveolar sacs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as a side note, for the medical aspects of this, uh, we were concerned about being able to deal with this in the field as it's resulted in fatalities like the Soyuz 11, and so we developed a field treatment protocol for uh, ebulism that was published just a few months ago. And there's just some more damage pictures. Well, so let's step back. Before we started flying an aircraft and going to space, there was a number of excursions to high altitude that uh, gave us uh, some real insight into some of the things that were happening. And I won't go through all these cases, but they are kind of interesting. Um, this was an Army Air Corps captain, uh, Hawthorne Gray, who went up, knew that oxygen was a problem, uh, or that hypoxia was a problem, and took uh, oxygen, but he ran out. And uh, unfortunately, on the way down, uh, he didn't have enough oxygen, and he, he suffered the consequence of, of exposure to a, a low ambient oxygen pressure and died. Now we know, um, based on the ability to deliver oxygen, that above 43,000 feet, you need pressure. Uh, you, you need. Uh, you need. Uh, that's the upper limit of positive pressure breathing. So I don't think he had positive pressure breathing, uh, which is required above 35,000 feet. So he was probably hypoxic. Uh, r regardless of that, because he, they didn't recognize the need for positive pressure breathing. Um, the Russians were, were uh, also doing a lot of high altitude ballooning, and this was one of those uh, missions that they did um, that went, this was the one that went to in the uh, 63,000 foot range, and um, the balloon ruptured, and as they were coming down, there were too many uh, wing nuts to take off to get the hatch open to bail out. So they all perished. So when, you, when people started realizing that going in these high altitude excursions, even though you were protected from the environment by a pressure vessel, you might want to consider an escape option. Um, this was Explorer 1, uh, which was in the, uh, the same year, a few months later. And the balloon, all, this balloon went to 63,000 feet. Um, and then on the way down, it, uh, it, ru it ruptured, and, uh, and the, uh, fortunately early on it was you know, slowed somewhat by the fact that it, the balloon itself formed a kind of a, a parachute, but that didn't last too long. And then it, uh, it, it broke up. Uh, having recognized the concern of what happened, they did have a bailout capability. The Russians had a bailout capability, but not a quick egress capability. And the three, uh, these were all uh, Army uh, officers um, bailed out just before uh, they hit. And that's, there's one of them up at the top and there's another one at the bottom. They, they didn't start the bailout till 5,000 feet and the last guy got out literally, you know, l less than a, several hundred feet from before the impact of the ground. There you see it hitting. Um, so I went back and looked at the history of pressure suits, and there was actually a, a patent in 1918, which is actually amazing that somebody would think of that, recognizing that uh, ballooning from the 1800s when it first started had resulted in this, out, this phenomenon called balloon sickness. They recognized the need for oxygen, but they also recognized the need for supplemental pressures. There was a uh, Scottish physiologist, uh, uh, J.S. Haldane, who um, uh, worked with a um, company in London that uh, C. B. Gorman that made diving suits, and th and that team formed the uh, Haldane Davis diving suit. Uh, at around the same time, 
uh, a gentleman named Chertovsky, who was also on the team for the uh, balloon that was the fatal uh, mishap, the Os Avakam 1, uh, was developing pressure suits. So you started to see pressure suits developing in the aftermath of the uh, World War I, really in the golden age of aviation, as all these activities, both ballooning and altitude, uh, high altitude uh, uh, aircraft were developing. So you started to see these early uh, um, pressure suits. This is the patent, patent from uh, uh, Fred Sample from 1918. And he never built it. He just had to draw it. This was Cherchovsky's suit. He did three suits that were tested in altitude chambers uh, up to 50,000 feet, and they actually did high altitude flights. And you can see these are open cockpits in the, you know, 10, 15 uh, uh, kilometer range, so you know, quite high up. Uh, and the, so they were tested both in the vacuum chamber and also in the real environment. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, J.S. Haldane um, and, and Davis from the uh, uh, C.B. Gorman Diving Suit Company uh, started developing a, a pressure suit called the Haldane Davis uh, di uh, Pressure Suit. And there was a gentleman named Mark Ridge who wanted to pursue this. And uh, so he actually took it in a test chamber up to uh, 50,000 feet uh, and eventually went to uh, 83,000 feet. Um, that suit was going to become a, a, a part of some of the records that were set in the uh, several years later. Uh, at the same time, and many of you, especially because this is a, a US effort, uh, remember Wiley Post, um, who was also uh, recognized the importance of pressure suits to get to high altitude. He was actually trying to capture the jet stream and win air races. Uh, and he contacted uh, a guy named Russell Colley, who had a long history in suit development uh, and worked for BF Goodrich. And they made three pressure suits. Uh, and he was able to fly in the Winnie Mae up to 50,000 feet. Uh, and that suit pressure, uh, the last suit, was 5.2. The earlier ones were in the 5 PSI range. Um, you can actually see the incredible resemblance to the diving suit uh, of the era, the Mark V uh, hard, hard hat diving suit that's been around forever. Uh, but they did incorporate some really cutting edge technology. Anybody know what that is? It's a LOX converter. Isn't that amazing? 1933, they had a, 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 a LOX converter that he carried in the aircraft. And it's very similar in design to what we use today. In fact, we used a bunch of these on, our, on the Red Bull Stratus program. This is the pressure chamber where they were tested. You can see the extreme amount of limited mobility he had. And I also like to include the fact that he also had an escape option too. But if you look at the fact that he had to climb up uh, a hatch on the top of the vehicle, the chance of it, him actually being able to get out of there, pressurized or unpressurized, was pretty limited. Perhaps he'd be lucky if the vehicle broke apart and he was just thrown out. But he did have an escape option as well. There were a number of developments. So you have the UK, you have the US, you have Russia, and you also have Europe. There was quite a bit of activity both in, this is a French uh, uh, test. Um, this, te this one never went uh, beyond the uh, ground testing, to my knowledge. Um, this was a diving suit for the stratosphere, which was developed by a meteorologic uh, aviator. Uh, and it would fly and provide supplemental oxygen, but it was only a PSI and a half or, or so, just enough to give supplemental oxygen, because he was only flying in the you know, uh, you know, range of, of, say, maybe uh, 20 to 30,000 feet. And you can see how clunky these things were, but amazing considering these were the 1930s. Drager, who still makes a lot of uh, diving gear, uh, developed this. This was one of their early uh, models. Uh, you, can, you can see how challenging that was. And then it got, over time, it got more and more sophisticated. Um, they would wear a mask inside. This, was, this one had quite good visibility because the helmet itself kind of went out sideways, so he could look around even with the mask on. Um, the Haldane Davis diving suit was uh, uh, taken by uh, Ferdy Swan and flown in a Bristol uh, aircraft up to uh, almost 50,000 feet. And then a second flight uh, a year later uh, went to 53,000 feet. 
this flight was fine because the uh, um, uh, the aircraft uh, um, had an uneventful course, but the second flight uh, they lost a wind windshield, and the suit itself was very uh, uh, useful in preventing any uh, damage from the wind blast. Um, so. World War, so you can see all these suits were being developed in the pre-war years. U.S., U.K., Russia, and Germany, uh, and France. Actually, there were some in Spain and, and Italy as well. Um, but as the war started to um, you know, develop, um, there was a fairly significant research effort that went into um, pressure suits, which is so somewhat surprising to me because most of the bombers at the time, even the super and turbocharged bombers, were not getting up above 30, 35,000 feet. Um, but uh, there was a, a group formed to start developing uh, in, enhanced uh, pressure suit um, capability. And it was Bell Aircraft Corporation, Boeing, uh, a guy named John Ackerman from a company in uh, Minneapolis that built uh, oxygen gear for aircraft and also uh, iron lungs for polio patients. Uh, and a colleague at Mayo Clinic who's pretty famous in the uh, aviation life support world, Walter Boothby. And they uh, developed a, uh, a whole series of pressure suits that uh, actually were the forerunner of much of what the Dave Clark suits uh, adopted later on. And I, I won't go through too much of these, but these were the, the, the Boeing Ackerman um, Boothby suit. Uh, the, the earlier suits, and they were all tested in chambers. Uh, at the same time, that all the rubber companies, Goodrich, Goodyear, and U.S. Rubber, were also collaborating to build suits uh, during the war years as well in a classified project called MX-117. And here that you see uh, some of the BF Goodrich suits uh, being tested. In this, uh, this was the Bell uh, P-39 Air Cobra. Um, they also had one that was pretty uh, uh, famous, the, the, the so-called worm suit, um, because of the pleated uh, configuration in it. And then uh, Goodyear also uh, developed suits, but you can notice that they were sleeker um, and uh, less, less bulky, um, but they, they were really prone to elongation. And here you see the suit uh, where the guy can barely see. So one suit. Uh, this suit had better mobility but worse elongation. The other suit had, um, was very cumbersome and heavy and bulky, but, but it didn't elongate. So some of the aspects as suit designers developed along the way was, well, you know, you've got to always constantly be trying to minimize the downside. Uh, James Henry, who's at, uh, uh, at USC, University of Southern California, started working on a more um, compact system using uh, the uh, capstan mechanical counter pressure system that became infamous as the uh, capstan suit uh, that was the, f the basis for all the early suits that the Air Force used um, such as the uh, MC uh, 3 and 4 uh, that were used in the early X planes. The X1 did not have one but the X1A, B, uh, E and X2 uh, also had suit, uh, were, were all wore pressure suits and had an escape system. Not always effective though. Um, based on the work for, of the, the BAM suit from World War II, after the war, um, David Clark Company uh, in Massachusetts started to take that and, and expand that into, into uh, follow-on suits, uh, full pressure suits. Here you see a couple of suits, there was a Dave Clark suit and also a BF Goodrich suit, which were the top contenders. And then there was also uh, Arrowhead, uh, which was another company. And these suits were t uh, heavily tested and evaluated in the um, um, altitude chamber and also in aircraft. Um, as the uh, X-planes evolved and the X-15 program started, Dave Clark took their uh, experience from the booth, the early BAM suit and their earlier uh, suits and developed the, uh, the full pressure suit that became known as the AP22S2. Uh, and that actually became the basis for follow-on suits that were the, the S900 and 1000 series suits. 
Uh, here was one of those, uh, another suit that was kind of more of the worm type suit. Uh, this was the Mark IV pressure suit, the BF Goodrich uh, Mark IV, tested in a plexiglass uh, uh, pressure chamber. It was also tested in centrifuges, and the Mark IV was the suit that was primarily used uh, in the Mercury program. Uh, although the Navy had a propensity to want to use full pressure suits, they did use partial pressure suits on their Stratolab flights. There was five Stratolab missions, uh, and here you see um, it was uh, uh, Ross and who was the other guy, John? Pr no, Prather was on the last one, but there was it was um, I'm blocking on his name, but uh, I love this picture here because you see him, you know, during one of their trial runs. <laughs> There he is with a cigarette and smoking. <laughs> you know, these suits were, despite the fact that they were less bulky, they were still fairly uncomfortable. It was like wearing a full body G suit. Um, unfortunately, on the last mission, which was a test of the Mark IV pressure suit, uh, and this was the day before Alan Shepard flew, they set a record 113,000 feet in an open gondola w with the Mark IV suit. and. Uh, launched from a carrier, uh, which is kind of novel. It neutralizes the wind, so you're not prone to having to wait for low wind days. Uh, and he, um, Vic Prather, who was a Navy flight surgeon, um, after the, the gondola lands back in the water and they're getting picked up by a helicopter, uh, slips off the, the gondola and drowns. And what happened to Gus Grissom? You know, same thing. There was also an, uh, an A-12 that broke up over California, and then both pilots survived, and one of those drowned. I think that was, uh, um, I think it was Ray Torek or, well, anyway, but the, the fact is that, it, that we had people drowning in suits in water repeatedly, and it never seemed like that lesson ever got conveyed that how important it was to have a good neck seal or keep your visor down or, or whatever. Um, the Air Force uh, used pressure suits in the stratosphere on quite a number of flights. There were three flights in the Man High series, which were to test life supports at uh, high altitudes in the 100,000 plus range. The uh, second mission, Dave uh, Simmons stayed up for 32 hours. Stargazer uh, flew once to test astronomy payload, and then there was the three Excelsior flights. So the Air Force had uh, five. Um, excuse me, they had seven flights in the stratosphere uh, using pressure suits and balloons. Um, the Russians, uh, in their early test phase, uh, used animals. We used them too, but that because their system required an ejection seat, they actually had an, a, an ejection seat integrated with a pressure suit, which I thought was kind of interesting. And, and these are actually from a museum in Moscow. Their first pressure suit uh, was, was uh, uh, a... Uh, the SK-1 was for the first five, which were men, and, the, and Va uh, Valentina Tereshkova uh, flew in the SK-2. There was not a whole lot of difference in those two suits. Um, the interesting thing about it, that all those missions required ejections, um, and that was because they didn't trust their landing system. And, and all the, par all the uh, cosmonauts were, were trained parachutists, and to this day, the Russians have this propensity to include full-up parachute training. And Valentina Tereshkova was specifically picked because she was a very qualified parachutist. Um, I, I won't go too much into detail on the Sokol suit, which evolved. Uh, but the Sokol suit was originally an aviation, high-altitude Russian Air Force aviation uh, pressure suit. And then after the Soyuz 11 mishap in, in 1971, they modified it for space. So the Soyuz K was the space early space uh, variant. Uh, they had a lot of the features that they see that you see today, such as a soft helmet, um, but they had a re the regulator was on the side, and they had an entrance through with that large apex opening. Um, that was 1972 and 73, they switched to the KM, uh, which got rid of the, uh, you know, the, the appendix uh, that, that you entered and used zippers, and they didn't like that because the zippers leaked, and they also tried moving the uh, regulator to a central position, and they also went to a two-pressure uh, uh, position. Um, one was the normal operating 5.8 PSI, and the other was a lower pressure 
uh, to account for uh, increased mobility needs. You could transiently turn down the pressure and get it going. And then this suit, the KV-2, was uh, start implemented in 1980, uh, and they've been using this uh, pretty much ever since then. So it went back to the appendix, not the zipper. They put the regulator on the center, and it had the two-stage regulator, two, two pressure settings for the regulator. And there you see the appendix that you, you actually uh, have, any, have any of you seen the Sokol suit where you actually put your legs in and then you pull it, pull it over and then you have a, a, a bunch of uh, um, rubberized material and you just basically scrunch it up and tie it with two rubber bands and then fold it up inside there and there's Mike Fole getting into his Sokol suit. Um, and then the, the Chinese have a launch and entry suit that's very heavily modeled after that as well. So I, I thought it, because most of you probably don't get too much exposure to the commercial side, I'll show you a few of the commercial products that are out there, or commercial and or private. This is one by uh, Pablo de Leon at University of North Dakota. And he's had a long interest in spacesuits. Now he's doing more planetary stuff. But he, this is an article on a, a bailout capability uh, full pressure suit. And he also has a launch and entry suit that he's working on that is looking at uh, uh, commercial markets as well. Uh, all the commercial companies now, Dave Clark Company and ILC, are also going after a Sokol knockoffs. And this is the CHAP suit, the Contingency Hyperbaric Astronaut Protective Suit. And I think it was evaluated here. You guys evaluated here uh, as part of the Constellation uh, suit program. It's pretty small. Um, I think it's less than. 15 or 20 pounds and a fairly small stowage volume. It's been tested now in the um, NASTAR simul uh, the NASTAR centrifuge. Um, companies have looked at it. I think XCOR has been looking at it, as has some of the other commercial companies um, because of its uh, its uh, ease of use. Um, there's another company, Orbital Outfitters in California, that has this industrial suborbital spacesuit. Um, I don't know that they've ever really tested this thing in a vacuum chamber, but I know the Dave Clark suit has been tested in more operationally relevant environments. And there shows the inner garments of the uh, orbital outfitter suit. Uh, then there's a new group on the block. It came out in 2010, Final Frontier Design. I don't know if any of you evaluated this suit as well. It's, yeah, it's, it's one of NASA uh, SBIR for glove work. And, uh, you know, this guy, um, uh, Moisev is a former Zvezda spacesuit engineer, and they're trying to make, uh, you know, affordable suits. This is the one that came out, their first generation suit in 2010. And it's, you know, it's got a lot of features that the Russian suit has. Um, this is the Gen 2, the yellow and the, the orange one is the Gen 3 suit. And actually, uh, it's been up to D.C., and there's Charlie Bolden taking a peek at it and showing that. I guess... Uh, I don't have a whole lot of insight on it other than to say that the, the company is actively seeking uh, clients. For a while there, they, were, they had a contract with uh, Zero to Infinity, which was a high altitude balloon program in Spain. But I haven't heard what, what's the follow up on that. There's just another showing it under its full pressure configuration. Uh, well, you, you don't want to hit any snags in the capsule with that thing. Um, ILC has, even though they've primarily focused on uh, EVA suits, have had a, a little history in both high altitude uh, pressure suits with the Air Force and also uh, intervehicular survival suits. And here's some, uh, you guys know Joe Cosmo, here he is in the, one of the suits that uh, was tested early on and they even had, th this was called the uh, briefcase suit because of its small size. And they were in the three and three to four psi range, and they also had an eight psi suit to uh, reduce the DCS risk if you had to get into it. And now they've got a number of commercial suits uh, that they're marketing actively as well, both to commercial and also um, um, government uh, to try to compete with the Dave Clark Company. So I'll talk a little bit about escape systems now. Um, if you go back, you see this. These were uh, two uh, articles in the 30s that showed high altitude bailout from a rocket and another one going up in a balloon. And then you see, even to this day, their follow-up uh, 
dreams about this, and actually the last two Star Trek movies have had space diving components to it, so I'll talk a little bit about that. You know, where this started uh, was in the Air Force escape test program called Project Excelsior in the late 50s and early 60s. It was a follow-on to a, an unmanned uh, dummy drop program called High Dive, which I've got some pretty extensive literature, and they basically tested some of the early uh, components of the high altitude bailout capabilities. At the time, the uh, aircraft were not flying that high. The U-2 could get into the you know, high 60s, 1,000 uh, foot range. The SR-71, uh, which came out in the early 60s, could get up to um, the high uh, 70s, maybe a little bit higher. And so uh, the Air Force wanted to test it in their operational environments. They did the dummy drops, they did the vacuum chamber runs, all that kind of thing. And so they did what they, they did Project Excelsior. And this was a MC3 pressure suit, partial pressure suit, very simple. Now it doesn't look like a partial pressure suit because it's got all this extra thermal stuff on. These are uh, actually mountain warfare, uh, that we call them vapor barrier boots. And that, that, that's the standard uh, cold weather fighting ensemble that the Army wears. And then I love the, you know, the red duct tape. And um, if you look at his pictures, he, he always had duct tape on him somewhere. So duct tape was a big part of the test program. Uh, one of the disadvantages he had was um, both this uh, seat pan with, which contained uh, recorders and oxygen and also a chest rig, which tended to lower his center of mass. Um, which we know now from the data analysis of the Project High Dive that a lower center of mass means that you're going to rotate with more blood going to your head. And unfortunately, he had that problem on his first jump. Um, this is from Life Magazine um, and the uh, book that he came out with called Long Lonely Leap. But on, on Excelsior 1, uh, he went unstable his drogue chute, which was supposed to stop the spin, came out early and wrapped around him, and he went into a high enough spin rate that he actually lost consciousness. I actually have the videotape of him describing it, but basically um, the spin gets really bad. He can't pull his arms in and cut anything away or do anything, and he passes out, and the next thing he knows, he's wake, he wakes up under canopy um, just before landing. So his, he had an automatic opener that saved his life. On his third jump, He's wearing the partial pressure suit. The seal that goes to the bladder on the right uh, hand came loose. Have any of you ever worn uh, partial pressure suits? Yeah. So there's a bladder there to fill the concavity of your palm. And uh, the, the tube that went to that bladder uh, failed. And, and so his hand swelled up. Now the glove acted as its own mechanical counter pressure when the ebulism in the hand uh, occurred and basically reached a, a, some kind of equilibrium point. It, in other words, it didn't continue to swell. But Joe, it happened um, in the high altitude range. He didn't abort the mission. He did, in fact, he didn't even tell anybody about it. Uh, he just gutted it out. His hand was dysfunctional. Unfortunately, you know, you, you often need your hands for things like grabbing handles and doing things, and he just recognized that he was going to have to do everything with his left hand. Um, but there he is after the flight. Um, and his hand has come back to a little bit smaller. It w it, he said it was about two, three times bigger than the, right, the left hand, and you can see it's redder. But he said after a couple hours it was completely normal. So exposure to vacuum in a focal capacity and an, uh, is not, it might incapacitate you or the limb, but it isn't necessarily going to kill you. But what's interesting, there's a great book called This New Ocean, uh, and you, you might have read this. John, it's, it was the book about Mercury, the Mercury program. Joe Kittinger was really good friends with Gus Grissom. And Gus knew about the activities that were going on with Excelsior. And so uh, in, uh, there was a memo that was written. And there was also, it, it's documented in this book called This New Ocean. The first two flights of the US space program on the Mercury Redstone, which was a suborbital mission, included a personal bailout system. And uh, both Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom wore uh, a harness with a, a belly rig. The rig was not attached inside until he, that was needed. 
Well, uh, th this shows Alan Shepard in the, uh, in the Mark IV suit with the personal parachute system. And the parachute would be off to the side. And after re-entry, uh, if the capsule descent uh, system, uh, the main parachute, was inadequate to decelerate it for a landing, that they would put the parachute on, blow the hatch, and get out. So there were, a f there were lessons learned from you know, the Air Force program. There's Gus Grissom's suit. They learned that he said, well, uh, Alan Shepard debriefed said, well, the, the harness is too low and it, it, it inert, inert, it's very hard to do anything or put it on in the seated p position, so they moved the harness up. And then after Mercury, uh, the Mercury Atlas series, they, they discontinued it. Interestingly enough, at the same time, the Russians were developing, you know, space systems. They were testing their systems in high-altitude stratospheric balloons. And this is the Volga balloon program, but if you look at the capsule, it looks remarkably like the Vostok. And in fact, it was essentially a Vostok that was configured for high-altitude uh, parachute bailout research. There was two test jumpers, uh, uh, Evgeny Andreov and Peter Dolgoff, both Russian Air Force colonels, and they were testing out um, high-altitude escape systems to see how high up you could eject. Remember, the Vostok series was going to be, they, they would eject out of the uh, vehicle, usually around 25,000 feet, and they wanted to see if you had a problem, uh, violent spin, drugs not working, whatever, if you could eject higher. So they, they were testing a higher altitude escape out of the Vostok capsule, the operational capsule. And Andreev goes out in the seat uh, using a non-pyrotechnic uh, uh, seat, and he ejects, does a free fall, and sets a world record. Dolgoff, Peter Dolgoff, is going to go out and do a high altitude opening, which if any of you know about high altitude parachute opening shock is, is a real problem. And unfortunately, um, when he goes out, his visor cracks. And this is the they were this is one, some of the practice runs they were doing out of the. And this capsule's in in Moscow in the Menino um, Air Force Museum. Um, there, there that you see Dolgov practicing with the with the suit. He's not wearing the uh, SK1. He's wearing the S1 uh, 3M, which is a, a bubble type uh, visor, as you see here. This is the uh, this is the suit type that he was wearing. It was a modified Air Force high altitude uh, suit. And unfortunately, and there you see him getting in there, you see the visor with the face plate down. Um, this is the back of the helmet, and that's a hole. And what happened was, um, as he's getting out, uh, he doesn't get a good clean exit, and he clips his helmet against the back of the capsule and knocks a hole in it. Now, he was at 86,000 feet. Um, he's he's 20,000 feet above Armstrong's line. The problem was he had his chute opened high at a high altitude. If he actually had done the same flight profile as Andreoff, he would have free fell down out of the death zone, and certainly probably he might have, I think, very likely survived. Um, but because his parachute opened at a high altitude, he also perished. Um, so he was another one of the ebulism cases. Um, now let's fast forward to the U.S. side. Um, the first flights of the uh, Enterprise, the approach and landing test vehicle, and the first four flights on Columbia, the uh, flight test phase, used the, uh, uh, these were basically the um, modified uh, U.S. Air Force SR-71 suits, uh, the, the 1030 suit, the ones for the shuttle were called the 1030A. And uh, they used the same suit and the same ejection system um, as the, uh, as the uh, SR-71. And here you see the SR-71 seat fitted in the Columbia for the first. It was in there. It, 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 was, it was used the first four flights. It was flown, I think, for six flights, but, but it was, uh, it was uh, uh, inhibited. The problem with that is you look overhead and you think, okay, now how am I going to eject out of this? And so it had a very kind of a kludgy system that required it to go back on rails and then blow overhead panels. But it would have worked um, for a, a reentry, loss of control, but probably uh, for a ejection during the powered phase of flight 
if you do the analysis, at some point uh, you're going to hit the main engine uh, plume. So it probably wouldn't work. After STS-4, the seat was decertified and removed, and they went to shirt sleeve uh, flight suits until STS-2551L. Uh, 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 and this is a shot of the Challenger breakup. There's the nose cone. There's the crew module intact. Um, a time uh, a moments later, it attains a kind of a true position because of the wire bundles coming out of it. The crew is only wearing the launch and entry helmet, which is an, uh, uh, an air hood for smoke. Uh, and so they suffered from um, hypoxia and then died from impact with the water. They broke up was in the 45,000 foot range and, and lofted up to 63,000 foot range. So they were, you know, perhaps transiently in the uh, ebulism range, but they were very quickly out of it. So their primary means of incapacitation was hypoxia, and their um, uh, death was from impact with the water. Uh, after that, uh, after several years of uh, testing on numerous types of escape systems, they came up with the uh, uh, the pole system that came off the side hatch, uh, and they had two modes of flight uh, escape, the mode eight, which was the uh, uh, glided control flight bailout, and there was another one which was called the mode nine, and there, this is actual cue card from, uh, that the crew wear on ascent and reentry. Say you're doing, uh, you have a, um, uh, an, a space shuttle main engine abort, you're too far over the ocean to come back and do an East Coast abort landing site, and you're not far enough across to do a transatlantic abort landing site in Spain or North Africa, you're going to have to bail out because you can't ditch the vehicle. They did tests on it and felt that it absolutely wasn't going to survive a water landing like most commercial airliners would potentially do if they were in a similar situation. So the Mode 8 was, was available to them in the event that they could not land the vehicle. And if there was a Challenger or perhaps a Columbia breakup, they could do this, uh, 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 they could get out uh, via the, the so-called Mode 9. The Mode 9, because there would be no wing, you, could, you didn't need the slide pole. But the problem with that is that you needed the slide pole to activate the automatic opener. So there were some concerns about how you had to integrate that in the aftermath of it. The early suits that were used were the, uh, the um, S-1032 um, um, partial pressure suit, uh, and that was used uh, for the most part uh, up till uh, fairly you know, recently, STS-88 in the late 90s. There were a few people that wore it because it would fit better uh, even after the ACES was introduced. Um, and. Uh, now we have the advanced crew escape suit, full pressure suit, the S-1035, um, which you see here. Now this suit was actually uh, something that we, you know, uh, very heavily evaluated in the high altitude bailout program I was involved with. Now, because there's always these parallel efforts, you see the same kind of thing happening with the Russians. The Russians, in the, in the heat of the Cold War to keep up with us, built a space shuttle, which probably bankrupted them. Uh, they only flew it once. Uh, it was flown unmanned, entirely um, uh, automated, automated and command, commanded. But they did a very robust program of evaluating the escape system for the, for the uh, Buran shuttle. And uh, it was not going to need, uh, it wasn't going to carry as, enough crew that it would have uh, a problem with some crew would having an ejection seat and some wouldn't. They took the uh, Air Force, a Soviet Air Force ejection seat, the K-36, which is a very good ejection seat if you've ever seen some of the Paris air shows where they've crashed into the ground. Uh, and they put it in the, shut in, in the Buran shuttle, and they uh, used a, a Sokol uh, variant with thermal protection. It's very similar to the Sokol suit, except it's, got, it's beefier and it's got a lot bigger uh, systems on it. And... Um, same pressure profile, dual, dual pressure uh, system, et cetera. Um, and uh, it was certified to uh, Mach 3 and, 30, uh, and uh, 30 kilometers. But the way they tested it was really phenomenal. They did high altitude tests out of MiG 25s at high speed. Um, and they did um, 
five progress launches to Salyut space stations. And instead of having an orbital module above the progress, they put an ejection seat. And they fired this e the ejection seat and the suit instrumented mannequins and, and actually tested it up to Mach 4.1 and, and uh, 41 kilometers. Um, so the Russians, you know, really thoroughly tested this system out. Now, that wasn't, there wasn't a man in the loop, but, you know, the test data was acceptable to them. And uh, this was some of the thermal burning that they had on some of those high altitude tests. This is a picture of, of, the, of the stretch suit. And what I thought was really cool about it was that it had a tensioner on it that allowed you to adjust uh, the arm uh, tension so that if, as the, as the suit pressure it might have elongated your arm, if you needed that, you could adjust it accordingly. So they had some pretty nice, I thought, human factors um, components to that. Now, we're going to switch over to the other part of this, the escape part, um, and kind of talk about this project I was involved with, this Red Bull Stratus. There were a number of uh, stratospheric uh, free fall attempts that have been ongoing in the last 10 or 15 years. Many of these um, have, uh, have not gone anywhere. In fact, I have this great clip I'll show you because um, it's kind of funny. Um, I know we're running a little bit over. Um, and there's only been one that's been really, um, really uh, close to uh, getting anywhere, and that was the uh, the flight with uh, Michelle Fournier. I'll have to show it you later. Um, Michelle Fournier, whose site uh, is still active, uh, was he's tried four different times. Um, he's using a modified uh, suit that was based on his work with the Hermes escape system. And uh, here he's been he's done four launch attempts out of Northwest uh, Canada um, using a capsule that's very similar to the Manhai capsule. Uh, and a, as, as near as I could tell, a, a partial pressure suit. Um, and there's one of the launch attempts where the balloon pyrotechnic fired and he didn't get to go. The, the last one that he had in 2009, his, uh, they were cycling a, a pressure in his um, capsule and the automatic opener fired and his parachute came out. So where this started was in the late 80s, the uh, you know, the, the Challenger accident had occurred, the, the uh, uh, CNES, which was the French Space Agency, and then later ESA said, hey, we want our own system. We don't want to depend on the U.S. So they developed the Hermes, which was a little mini shuttle, um, very similar to what uh, Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser looks like. And as part of that test program, they had a, an escape capability from the Hermes that was called S-38, which stands for SOUT, which is French for jump, 38 kilometers. And this is the actual dummy drop that they did uh, with the SOUT uh, 38 suit, uh, the parachute, and the instrument package. Um, anyway, Hermes uh, had an escape capability, um, at least in the, in the design phase of it. Um, and it, was ne it never got any further than concept development and some of the early tests like the S-38 test. Anyway, uh, the program was canceled in 94 due to uh, cost overruns. As you can imagine, a program like this was very expensive. So that leads us up. Uh, hmm? uh, you know, I, I, I don't. I can, I can look up in the literature, but he's, he, uh, as I understand it, um, it was, I was a, a, a Russian Baran shuttle um, modif modified suit. Yeah. Um, uh, this was some of the uh, the uh, 
info on the Red Bull Stratus. And I brought uh, an article that was written by the Dave Clark guys on the suit lessons learned. And I've got these electronically. And if you want, you can have this copy. There's also the, the launch and entry suit from the ILC folks. So in, 19, in 2005, Felix Baumgartner comes up with this idea. He wants to do a high altitude jump. Uh, he gets with Joe Kittinger in 2007. They start working. And that, in 2008, Joe Kittinger is impressed enough with the um, resources available, read funding, that um, he talks the Dave Clark Company into authorizing the use of a suit for uh, private use. In 19... 66, uh, Dave Clark Company loaned a suit to a civilian test jumper named Nick Pianata that did not go well. And after that, they said, we'll never do that again until uh, this program came along. It took the, uh, the U-2 SR-71 S-1034 suit and modified it so that it had more cooling and more mobility. It's actually called the S-1034E suit. And three of these were acquired. Uh, it had enhanced mobility, enhanced thermal protection, and a lot of other uh, features, in, in, in addition to being custom built. Um, uh, obviously, the suit position for a U-2 pilot is sitting, you know, with arms out uh, flying there or doing stuff with the instrument panel, whereas the, this suit is designed to be flown as, a, as a, a free fall suit so that you want much more mobility, including both in the upper, upper extension and, and behind you. And uh, so, Felix went through uh, the anthropometric testing, and we had three suits that we acquired. Um, one suit was for training, and then two suits were for the operational test and flight phase. And this just shows you some of the, uh, the we uh, uh, used a conformal helmet with a lot of antennas attached to it, a dual feed, oxygen feed system with uh, um, crossover. Um, so there was redundancy in case one, uh, one system failed or was, was breached. Uh, we used boot heaters, a lot, of, uh, a lot of enhanced features on it. I can get into more detail later. Um, the bailout system, um, this says 5.5. It's actually 11.5 uh, uh, bottles. This, this is an early flight version. The, the bottles we used on the final flights were much bigger. Um, one of the things we were worried about was the free fall spin, and the problem with that was that the way to get out of it is with a drogue chute, and we t intentionally uh, had a drogue that was developed, but we w wouldn't, weren't going to use it in the normal configuration because it would slow, slow the free fall down. So this, uh, the drogue chute development phase was probably about a four-year flight test program, which there's some pretty nice report on that as well. Um, one of the things that we had is the means to deploy the drogue in case uh, it, the, he felt that the spin was uh, too much. And there was also an automated system that would detect a spin rate that was tested in free fall to, and determined to be the point where you would no longer have good functional control. And so we had both a manual and a crew activated drogue system. The shuttle uh, advanced crew escape suit used a, an automatic, automatic drogue. Uh, we did a, quite a number of tests, including vertical wind tunnels, unpressurized and pressurized bungee tests to make sure we got good clearance so we wouldn't have a mishap like the Peter Dolgov case. Um, we did six vacuum chamber runs, um, I think eight high altitude, 27,000 foot, and quite a few from uh, 15,000 foot. We had six thermal vacuum chamber runs over in Chamber E in San Antonio at uh, Brooks City Base. Um, two unmanned flights where we tested all the systems, including the uh, uh, systems that he would carry in the chest pack, and then three manned flights. And if you guys have time, I can show you the video. This is all the test data that came out of it. All that's available. In fact, Red Bull is very open about sharing all the uh, parameters, including the physical parameters. But I'll, sh I'll show you the video because it's, you guys, it's pretty impressive. Uh, we, set, uh, quite, we set three major records for free fall, uh, highest exit, uh, highest free fall, and fastest speed, which was uh, Mach 1.25. Chuck Yeager, uh, exactly 65 years before this, uh, went Mach 1.06.
So let me uh, stop this just to show you all the. This is compiled data. So it takes all the sensor data, IMUs, uh, accelerometers, uh, GPS. We had three GPS systems to gain it. So you have airspeed uh, that goes from zero to 900 miles an hour, altitude, which starts at 80, at, at 127,000 feet, respirations and heart rate, three point of, pilot point of view cameras, one looking up from the chest pack, one looking up from the left the right leg and one looking down on the left leg. Um, you've got um, Mach here and miles per hour here. Um, you've got altitude in feet here. Altitude versus time, G uh, versus time. This is the uh, flat spin, this is the opening shock, and this is the landing. And then this is Mach versus time with the green being the 30 plus seconds he spent above Mach 1. And then the three axis accelerometer, this little chart here shows where the column of blood is. When he's standing up on the, on the uh, step, the column of blood uh, shows 1G down. And as you, you know, you'll see that in free fall, it'll do all kinds of stuff. But it never gets into the dangerous range above 2 and a half Gs. And then what will show up here is a, uh, uh, the data put into a three-dimensional uh, mannequin. Now, there's a lot of data here, so it's very hard to see it all at the same time, but here, here goes. He'll salute. Uh, he'll step off. Camera's uh, running. The little 3D model shows up, the SolidWorks model. You see the curvature of the Earth. He's 300 miles an hour, 123,000 feet. 120,000 feet, he's 500 miles an hour. Uh, 10,000 feet, he's 700 miles an hour, he's Mach 1. He's in a roll, he goes into a slight roll to the right, and then it reverses and goes to the left. You can see the, the, the G over here where his blood is, is headward now. So it's about a one, one negative G. Now he's on his back in an inverted flat spin. He's just come back through the sound barrier. At 73,000 feet, uh, he comes through the sound barrier and regains control. And then, you know, the rest is history. So, Free fall time was about four minutes and 20 seconds, and then another five minutes under canopy, or uh, in, um, uh, under canopy. The uh, documentary is gonna be released in about a month. Um, on the project. So a lot of this footage will be available then. At 35,000 feet, his suit will start to depressurize and you'll have much better mobility. Right about. You can see the lot more aerodynamic force in it now with the seat and pressurized. This was our high out this is the high jumps we practice right now at 27,000 feet. So this is this is what this was our low altitude jumps. In a few um, minutes, you'll see the parachute opening at about 9,000 feet. The 
just looking at his altimeter to see where he, how high up he is. It's pretty easy to see, though. You can start seeing more features on the ground. The sky is a lot different color. I don't know if you want to watch this whole thing. But we can ask some questions. Any questions? If you have any, you can email me too. All the attitude generation to the start of the reset. You mean in the early phase? Right. Well, early on he falls pretty stable, but if you've ever been in a zero G parabolic flight and you move anything, it you know it's once something starts it just continues and. So what happened is he was worried about his visor heat, and so he, he reached down to, do a, uh, to, to make sure his visor heat was on. He was really paranoid about that. And th that little bit of motion just starts the ball rolling. And there's not enough aerodynamic control. And then once he is going through this, we, we really don't know how the human body flies in the <coughs> transonic region. We know aircraft can have difficulty, and a human's not very aerodynamic. So. Um, he got into this, it was not as a result of going through the sound barrier, it was, it was he, he actually went unstable before he went into, the, into it. Um, we were very worried, we were watching it from a long range tracking camera, and we could see the, 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 the rotations, but as long as we didn't see a drogue shoot, we knew we were, we were okay. So he'll make, he makes some, he's, he has, he's calling for smoke and making sure everybody's there. Any other questions? All right, great. John, I, John, I remember, I think we talked once and you were talking about on the shuttle when you said the CDRs weren't wearing their gloves. Does that affect everybody? Does that affect the entire suit pressure circuit or does that just affect that one person's suit? Oh, um, it, it should only affect that just person. Just one suit. Yeah. Does having the suit... Sorry? Yeah, you, you were mentioning, you said about 25% of the CDRs didn't wear their gloves on entry. You're going to increase oxygen. The problem, I mean, it happened. Columbia, I think there were three people that didn't have their gloves on. One didn't have their helmet on. And, um, you know, if you don't have your glove on, it, when you depressurize, you're going to instantly, um, you know, not be able to get a, a viable atmosphere. So. And the thing is, at those high altitudes, every breath you take, you're just off-gassing oxygen. You know, you don't necessarily want to hold your breath, but you don't want to be breathing either. And actually, one of the things that was interesting, we went through a whole bunch of training with Felix. Uh, turns out Red Bull has the problem with people drowning in their surfing high, their toe-in surfing comp competitions. So they train their athletes to hold their breath for seven minutes. And so the, there's a program that Red Bull has on holding your breath. And I mean, they took a guy just off the street, and, and with a, a, in a day or two, he could hold his breath for seven minutes, which is longer than I think you could even stay viable. So we had that training so that, you know, you, you can hold your breath, and you'll, you're, you'll be okay. The, these guys that do these, uh, you know, descents, you know, the free, free, free descent, they'll, they'll have that problem too. Um, so you can hold your breath for a long period of time. It's when you're breathing that you're off-gassing oxygen and actually the wrong thing to do. Plus you're exposing your lungs. All right, cool. Well, if you have questions, you can just free, feel free to email me. And uh, thanks a lot.